Hello, everybody out in DragonCon land. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, this is one of our Q&As as part of the Brit track. And I've got a very special guest with me today that I'm very excited to introduce to you. This is Mr. Edward Russell, who was the brand manager of Doctor Who during the times of Tennant, Smith, and Capaldi. So, how are you doing, Edward? I'm good, thank you. I'm intrigued why I'm a very special guest. Do you ever have any normal guests or just special guests? I'm sort of like a normal guest. <laughs> you're, you're levels above me, so you're very special. <laughs> I'm very honored, thank you very much. So, how have you been? I've been good. Uh, we've had lockdown in the UK for just over five months. It's easing a fair bit, um, but things are far from normal. I'm not sure when they'll ever get back to normal, um, but it's good. It's put a greater emphasis on being at home and making the most of, of where you live. And I don't know, realizing what really counts, the friendships that are important and finding new ways to sort of enjoy your life a bit. Mm -hmm, absolutely. All right, so let's go back a little bit. There's uh, since you have not ever been to Dragon Con, which is something we have to remedy. Yes, thank you. I'd love to. I've been to Atlanta, of course, for Hulanta, but yes. uh, never to to Dragon Con. I'd love to come along one day. So well, we, we will get that. that yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we will get that fixed. Um, so there's going to be a lot of people watching this that have never met you. So mm -hmm. let's start a little bit about first who you are, just how you came to be the Edward Russell that we all know. Well, um, I um, have been in the entertainment industry for close to 25 years. I started off in the record business um, in the mid-90s in London, and that was the height of the Britpop era, and I'm sure even the US fans will be aware of bands like Oasis and Blur and Suede and how important that was. I worked for a record company, um, and they were doing really cool artists, um, people like Prodigy and the Charlatans. And there's me who loves Pet Shop Boys and Madonna and ABBA. Um, but it was great, great to be part of that. Um, I, I, I learned a lot, mainly about copyright and obviously a fair bit about music. So I then moved into TV via the online side um, and working for Top of the Pops, which you may have heard of. Top of the Pops was <laughs> a very big show in the, US, in the UK, uh, ran for over 40 years and was our music show. Uh, I suppose the equivalent of American Bandstand in some ways, but mm -hmm. somehow bigger than that. Um, and I did the online content, um, the website, the red button offering we call the interactive stuff. I did that for five years. Um, and then uh, I sort of sidestepped into TV, or closer into TV, working for a little show you may have heard of called Doctor Who. Um, and as you said, I joined there in 2006 when David Tennant became the Doctor. And I stayed right until the final moments of Peter Capaldi's Doctor at the end of 2017. So mm -hmm. that's, that's a very brief journey of how <laughs> I got that far. And I'm sure you're going to want to know more, but, you know, hopefully that's given you an overview. Um, for those who have an idea but may not know specifically, what is a brand manager? What all kinds of things did you oversee? Well, it's funny. When I was doing the job, people would ask that question and I would try and answer and never do it successfully because it was such a wide, broad um, position. It was difficult to explain, but I've, I've got better at it since I've left. So if you imagine an orchestra uh, and Doctor Who is the orchestra and you've got the writers, the actors, the TV programs, Doctor Who Confidential, the magazines, blah, blah, blah. They're the violins, the cellos, the horns and all that kind of stuff. What is central to that orchestra to keep it all together is the conductor. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was my job. It was kind of, the, if that was the orchestra, then I was the conductor. I wasn't, didn't write the music. I wasn't playing the music. Uh, all these talented, talented people were doing their stuff, but I was kind of keeping them all together. And that's the job of a brand manager to make sure they've got everything they need to stay in time to keep in tune and to follow the music in front of them. Um, so that's what I did. So I got involved with everything. Um, the show itself, its website, its Twitter feed, its Facebook pages, but also things like Doc 2 Confidential, the behind the scenes stuff, um, the behind the scenes things on DVDs, the books, the magazines, the toys, the live events like the big event we did in London for the 50th anniversary, the musical concerts we did. Um, oh, so much stuff, t-shirts, key rings, all the <laughs> things like that, and all the big things like the world tour as well I was involved mm -hmm. in. 
I'm not going to take credit. I didn't do those stuff. I just kind of was across it all and helping guide people and hopefully for fans making this stuff as good as it possibly could be. Because as a fan, I grew up as a fan and that's really important to me um, that fans get their money's worth and that something, if it's got the Doctor Who name on it, it felt true to the Doctor Who brand. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, if you watched it, read it, collected it, wore it, attended it, you were involved in some way. Yeah, and some things a lot more than others. You know, I, mm -hmm. I have glanced at a key ring, um, but uh, something like the proms that we did uh, in the Albert Hall in London, I would have been, done everything from helping write the scripts to pushing a Dalek onto the stage. <laughs> I was very, very involved in, in that kind of thing. The glamour of live performance. Uh -huh. Yeah, TV is not glamorous at all. There are glamorous bits to it. When you get to go to the award shows and stuff like that, that's really glamorous. And I was really lucky because there were people that worked on the show for as long as I did, and they were stood in muddy fields at 4 o'clock in the morning in the middle of Wales filming the show. And there was me uh, going to all the, um, the, the the showbiz swanky showbiz events in London, mm -hmm. uh, which they didn't get to, which probably they thought was a bit unfair, but uh, <laughs> tough job. Somebody had to do it. There you go. Now, uh, as I understand it, this is a position that wasn't uh, in place during the Eccleston year. Is that right? Well, not entirely. Um, so there was a, a chap that was kind of doing that work, Ian Glutchfield, who became my boss, and a, a very, very clever man who um, oversaw everything that happened. And he had the very bright idea um, in that Christopher Eccleston era not to do a lot of merchandise. Um, and that might seem bizarre, but we, nobody knew if the show was going to be a hit. It could, Absolutely. Have been, it could have been a massive flop. And nothing says flop more than stores like Toys R Us having loads of unsold merchandise on it or mm -hmm. books that just are in the bargain bins in, in you know, your, your, your local bookseller. So his, his plan was to keep it small so that that couldn't possibly happen. And that meant by the time I came along to help him for the second series, everything exploded. And there was huge interest, huge appetite for mm -hmm. things like to adventures for those books, um, for special collector's editions and all that kind of stuff. So, um, it, you know, it, it was foreseen that that was how it would go. It was it was very, very clever. Um, and um, I was there to be at the beginning of the explosion, I guess. Um, I was going to save audience questions for a little later, but this leads into uh, one of the ones that I got. Um, Normally, when we would be doing this, uh, we would be in a ballroom in front of a crowd of people and we would take audience questions. And since that's not a possibility for this, I did a little pitch on Facebook last night to give people the opportunity to have a question included. Um, one of those questions is from uh, Andrew Yeager, and he asks, uh, Lego and Mattel have spoiled elements of movies and shows with early toy releases. How was it decided what details to release to toy companies and other licensees at the risk of information leak? And how do you balance good toy releases uh, with spoilers for fans? Like when do you, how do you kind of line these things up in a timeline? Yeah, it's a very good question, Andrew. And it's really tough because in order to produce something like an action figure, um, production has to happen ideally a year before it hits the shelves. Mm -hmm. They have to be sculpted, approved, and get made in China. They have to be shipped from China. It's a really funny story. Part of the reason why there was a delay um, uh, on some of the merchandise coming against Series 1 is because a ship had sunk on its way from China uh, with a lot of Doctor Who merchandise in it, um, and it never made it. So uh, that, was, that was part of the, the problem there. Um, but yeah, so there's, I think there's two questions that Andrew might be asking, is, is how we manage the information going to the companies to stop it from leaking, but also how we decided when it would get released, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, we had to put trust in um, those companies they signed NDAs, non-disclosure agreements. They were, you know, threatened with losing everything, their limbs, if it leaked. And you can only hope for the best in that circumstance. Um, quite often, they would, you know, almost, you know, always, in fact, they would uphold that and they would be great, but something would leak along the way. It would be a silly thing like um, an Amazon listing would go up for a book mm -hmm. or 
something and it's just you know we learned to look out for these things as the years progressed but we didn't know that stuff and a lot of it was new anyway so sometimes things leaked um uh which we wouldn't have have wanted to in terms of um merchandise getting out early deliberately even um i don't think we really did that on doc two there's some examples of some things that happen not necessarily merchandise but examples of um magazine covers that uh that some fans might have considered um spoilers i can think of one example being against series three dalek episodes um daleks in manhattan and yes. evolution of the daleks now yeah. there's a Big TV listings magazine in the UK, which I'm sure you've heard of, called Radio Times. That shows how old it is. It's still got the, term, the word radio mm -hmm. in it. And Russell T. Davis had the idea of putting the Dalek hybrid sec uh, on the cover, which if you've seen the episode, you'll be aware is, is a hybrid between a human being and a Dalek, the Dalek mutant that sits inside the Dalek. If you're not a fan of Doctor Who, you'll be wondering what I'm going on about. <laughs> If you're not a fan of Doctor Who, you're probably not watching this, uh, <laughs> this particular interview. Um, and it would be a spoiler because that wouldn't actually be seen until the end of the first episode. But we knew the magazine would be on the shelves before then. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, some fans at the time complained about this. And they said it had ruined the show for them. Um, and I think people have to remember that most people that watch the show aren't fans, if that makes sense. And by fans, I mean the guys that are watching this, the guys that buy the merchandise. Um, in the UK, I can only talk about the UK in this particular instance because of, of when it was transmitted. There was eight, nine million people watching that episode. Uh, and yet Doctor Who magazine was only bought by 50,000 people. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we've upset 50,000 people, that's a real shame. But the other um, nearly eight million people possibly may have came because they saw that magazine cover so right. it's a balance between promotion and getting viewers to watch the episodes against teasing there's a big difference between a spoiler and a teaser a spoiler is when things are ruined and you know the answer you know that river song is um amy's daughter or you know that peter cabaldi is going to be in the day of the doctor a teaser is, is something different and you know so there's a balance that's there I'm not sure we always got it right but the important thing is we we made the decision at the time for the right reasons, mm -hmm. I think. So, um, and, you know, I can't off the top of my head ever think of any merchandise that got out there earlier than it should have done mm -hmm. um, with Doctor Who. We were kind of lucky with that, probably because we started small and grew. That's what I was thinking when I read his question. I, I know of, you know, lots of examples of a character that's in a Star Wars movie, you know, that you might not have seen or heard of yet, and suddenly there's a toy on the shelf. But I couldn't yeah. really think of an example in Doctor Who where that had happened. I think it's a big difference as well, as well between those uh, huge movie franchises and Doctor Who because of the way that Doctor Who's made and by the BBC, which is a, um, it's not only a not commercial organisation, but it actively has to not be commercial because mm. the way that it, it funds. And I know this might be difficult for some American understand, audiences to understand because it's not like your PBS at all. Um, and so we would actively not try and do that, whereas I think those... Um, big US franchises or you know big global franchises want to make money and they can there's nothing stopping them so they'll, they'll put stuff on shelves early so it's mm -hmm. too. Um, I have another question from Shane Doherty and we mentioned the 50th anniversary a few minutes ago and there's some particular uh, things around that and he wants to know um, no I actually uh, there seemed to be a noticeable difference in marketing in America, starting with Matt Smith's first season. Yeah. Um, that's when we started to see a much greater presence in Target shelves and Walmart shelves of the DVDs. The episodes were presented in a different way on BBC America, that kind of thing. Um, was that something that either um, because of an uptick in interest in America or you know that you're leading up to the 50th anniversary, was that an intentional thing? What was the difference in how the show was marketed going into Matt Smith. Yeah, um, it's nothing to do with the 50th. It's all to do with BBC America. So prior to series five or season five, as you might call it, um, the Doctor had shown in the US on the Sci-Fi channel mm -hmm. um, and it uh, moved on to BBC America in 2010. It, it may have got a second view showing on, on BBC America before then, I don't know, but it then be, got an exclusive window on BBC America. So it would be on that channel before any other for the first six months 
um, of broadcast. <clears throat> so that was because a deal was struck with BBC America. Um, kind of goes without saying that BBC America would invest in BBC programs. Um, and so an emphasis was put on to the marketing and promotion for BBC America. And that changed my job, my job uh, dramatically. We suddenly had um, extra bosses, not just the <laughs> In, in Wales and in London, but suddenly BBC America had um, requirements from us and, and I was going to say huge demands as if they were really difficult. That's not the case at all, but it was it was an extra channel that we had to um, uh, talk with and, and deal with. Um, so that's the, re that's the reason why it changed. And yes, it had a, a massive impact, um, but it also doc took Doctor Who to a global brand. And because it then became a big worldwide global brand, that led to things such as Lego uh, and the, or the toys happening in the game, the involvement of Doctor Who in the, in the Lego game, which wouldn't have happened had Doctor Who remained uh, just a British, small British niche cult show. Right. So, yeah, a lot of work, but I think it paid off, definitely. You know, I can say as a fan since the early 80s, you know, growing up as a Doctor Who fan in America, you would have to go to specialty shops you would have to find some out of the way, you know, bookstore that carries, you know, weird British things to find Doctor Who merchandise, to find the books or the comics or whatever. And coming from that perspective, and now you're in a place where there's big end caps in Target of Doctor Who uh, DVDs and stuff with signage and all this kind of thing is just the most like you would never think that that would ever happen well that's kind mm -hmm. of the only reason to go to target as far as i'm concerned <laughs> oh, there, you've, got to, you've got to remember that it wasn't that different in the uk back in the 80s and the 70s yeah. 80s. there just wasn't that much merchandise and there wasn't the appetite for stuff yeah. so um the books um were, were available in all bookstores it wasn't like i'm sure you 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 just mentioned it was in the us at that time but you there wasn't a huge amount of merchandise so so I, I get what you're saying but at the same time in the uk it felt really amazing to go to toys r us or our big supermarkets like tesco and asda and see doctor who market merchandise on the shelves that yeah. just didn't exist when i was young um and you know uh, to see doctor who featured on other tv programs that was all new as well mm -hmm. um, and that's why my job was important because I'm not well, I'm partly responsible for that happening, but mainly to manage it, to make sure these guys don't go wild with all the stuff they do. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, another question as kind of a follow up from Matt Sweatman from a marketing and licensing standpoint, classic who and new who uh, were treated more or less as separate properties. Were there any particular challenges that you faced in how to present the two lines? And in particular, around the 50th anniversary, when a lot of the products started to be about the whole franchise and not one or the other, and the 50th anniversary had its own special marketing, its own branding. Yeah. Uh, how, how were those decisions discussed and what were the challenges in kind of setting that up? Okay, so I think there's three questions here. There's first of all, why were they, why were they separated? Um, secondly, about the branding, and thirdly, about the 50th specific stuff. Yeah. Um, they were deliberately separated at the beginning. Um, some of the research that the BBC did um, very early on um, around the return, so in 2004 when it was being um, prepared, was that um, a huge amount of the public were aware of Doctor Who, but they'd made the decision that they weren't going to watch it. Um, and that's because they associated it with cheap sets, um, wobbly scenery, um, men in green suits and stuff like that. It had that notoriety. Some of it's deserved, and but most of it isn't. But that was the perception that the public had of it. And therefore, they thought that the, the 21st century version would be no different. Right. So we were, I say we, this was a year before I started, but um, I became so invested in it, I feel like I was there already. Um, we made a deci decision to separate the two elements. Also, you've got that issue that um, if you've never watched Doctor Who before, especially if you're eight years old, or even if you are older, you don't want to think that you have to invest in something that goes all the way back to 1963 to enjoy this new series that's starting. So we kept the two separate. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the branding, well, we wouldn't normally have done that. We wouldn't have normally pushed classic one way 
and modern, as it were, uh, the other way. If we were, we certainly wouldn't have two separate logos. But it's the fans' fault that that happened. So um, Doctor Who was never going to come back with the same logo it had when it ended because that's not how it works. You do a logo that suits the TV series that you're promoting. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't be held back by history of something that's been off the screen for 16 years. So um, that was the logo that was designed, the, the sort of, we call it the taxi light one, the orange lozenge, as it were, that came back with Christopher Eccleston's Doctor. And the plan was that all the classic stuff would move over to that as well. And in particular, the DVD releases, which yeah. were still going through the process of, of being issued. Um, I think some tests were done and fans were up in arms about that. They were really unhappy because at that point, the DVDs were issued um, with a version of the the movie logo, uh, mm -hmm. which in itself is a version of the John Pertwee logo. I don't want to get too complicated, but that was the logo on there with a sort of background of the TARDIS roundels from the 1980s. And that was how the DVDs looked. And that's how the fans that we interviewed wanted it to carry on looking. And, and I get that. I mean, let's face us, face it. Us fans are a little bit, a little bit on the spectrum. And I do get that you've got your shelf of DVDs, and you don't want it to suddenly look different. You want everything to be the same and the logo at the same heights. And yeah. um, why, why would we upset the fans by deliberately changing that? Um, I don't know that the current regime feels the same way, but uh, we certainly didn't want to deliberately upset mm -hmm. people. Um, it seems kind of a, a weird own goal to do. So a decision was made um, to have a classic series logo and a modern series logo. Um, and it's all because of the DVDs. As we moved on, there were lots of calls to bring it together. Um, that's what every other brand does. No other brand has two separate logos. You've got variants. So Star Wars, Star Wars, for example, have got variants. You've got things like the Bat logo has advanced over the years. Mm -hmm. um, same with the Bond logo, but you don't normally have two separate, very different identities. Um, and I can remember actually in the 50th anniversary uh, year, um, a lot of thought was given to giving the, a single logo then to change the logo and make it a single one then. And some talk was given, and I don't think this has ever been much publicized or talked about, to going back to that very first 1960s logo that appears on An Earthly Child stacked with the very um condensed who and doctor written across the top yeah. because when we looked at it it was very very simple and it just worked you know it didn't really need to do anything else um that idea got mentioned and there's a lot of people it has to go to including very senior people at bbc um and and they were like stop changing your logo <laughs> because most franchises don't change their logo i think because doctor who's had a history of it fans kind of expect it yeah. And so we kind of stuck with a version of the, the Matt Smith logo instead. But uh, it did get sneaked onto the beginning of uh, Day of the Doctor, actually. That is the that is the logo mm -hmm. that is on the screen, is the original one, which is kind of nice. Um, in terms of a 50th specific one, I think there was some stuff that mentioned 50th. Um, there was a badge designed, um, a badge design that was, that, that was used, but it wasn't used heavily. And I think it was Stephen Moffat actually said, you can't just resell old stuff by putting a 50th anniversary logo on it. That's unfair. Um, and he's quite right. You know, mm -hmm. we put it on stuff that was specific to the 50th anniversary and that was new um, in the 50th year. Um, but there was never any talk of reissuing the entire DVD range or the entire book range with that 50th logo on it. I think there are some TV and movie, fran movie franchise that would do that. Um, but the BBC wasn't going to do it. So uh, so that's that was kind of a concession that stuff in the 50th year got that badge on it instead. Mm -hmm. so, uh, have I answered that question? Absolutely. Good. Matt, Very early. <laughs> <laughs> um, you had mentioned, um, hang on one second. We'll cut this little bit out. Okay, sorry. <clears throat> Um, you had mentioned a few minutes ago, you were talking about, sorry, I, I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought. However, this little bit can be cut out. Rob, slice. <clears throat> uh, you had talked earlier about uh, your, your work from uh, the beginning of Tenant through the end of Capaldi. Were you on set for filming Jody's first scene? No, I wasn't. I wasn't at all. I was there for Peter's last scene. 
which is obviously on screen is continuous because he regenerates mm -hmm. and then turns into Jody. But that was actually filmed a week or two later. Yeah. Um, and that was a very sad day. Um, it, was, it was right at the end of the day. Um, Peter was very serene. Uh, and, and it was really sad because then there were speeches and presents afterwards. Um, uh, but I wasn't invited onto the set for Jody because that was that was spoilers for the new series, and it was a new team coming in to do that. Right. Um, I'm don't worry, there was no kind of like uh, upset on my behalf. Uh, <laughs> having made the decision to leave, I realised that there would be, you know, that that was going to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's uh, it's somebody else's show and or, or property from then onwards. So. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I didn't get to be there for part of that. I've never met Jody actually um, at all. So that's something maybe one day I'll get invited to a convention where she's at and I'll get to meet her. <laughs> well, when we have you at Dragon Con, we'll make sure it's the same year that Dragon Con is able to get Jody in. She'll be a special guest, yeah. whereas I'm a very special guest. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I get it. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about um, that changeover from Russell T. Davies to uh, Stephen Moffat. You're one of the crew persons who was there during a, a bit, the actually the first big showrunner change. Yeah. How did that affect your job? Was there changes in the way that uh, you approached how you did it? Or was there uh, was there different expectation from the production office for, you know, the licensees and things like that? Well, I think the major thing is that Russell was a lot more involved in stuff than Stephen was. And I don't want to make this sound like I'm being critical of Stephen because the fundamental thing is that the show suddenly became a lot bigger under Stephen. Oh, yeah. um, fundamentally because of the BBC America stuff that you mentioned. So there was suddenly a lot more merchandise lines. Um, there was um, a greater emphasis on stuff happening globally than there had been um, under Russell. And so uh, Russell wouldn't have been able to, to be across everything as much as he had been if he'd stayed anyway. So that's the reason for it. Um, but that made my job easier under Russell in some ways because um, uh, Russell had an opinion on everything and it was always a really good valid point as well. Um, silly little things about colours of things. Um, he's just an incredibly clever person, Russell, um, and uh, would often give very um, sensible advice if you needed it. Um, so my job in some ways was I was kind of like being trained under Russell and and when Stephen came along I was kind of let loose I'm not trying to say that Stephen wasn't across stuff at all that that's not the case um it's just that there was more of it so he was less able to be across it but also I'd been at the show for four or five years at this point and so I knew better what I was doing I probably knew more about merchandise than Stephen would have at that time anyway so um I never made decisions without him or the other producers working with executive producers working with him, but I was able to advise more clearly to him about choices being made. Because just because you can write Doctor Who doesn't mean you understand about um, uh, displays in, uh, in toy stores, which surprisingly <laughs> I do. Um, and because and, it's all the sort of stuff I've learned. I've learned so much, everything that Doctor Who touched, whether it be merchandise or musical concerts or, or, or websites, I've had to learn the background of that. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm, I've been left incredibly well experienced in many things. Um, uh, yeah, so hopefully that answers that question about the change. Well, it was definitely a change, a, yeah. a very, very definite change. Um, talking about the events, which you, you staged some massive, massive events from the proms concerts to the world tour, what were some of the logistical nightmares that you faced in having to put these things together? Oh, I mean, where do, where do I begin? <laughs> the Proms uh, um, concerts in London and the Royal Albert Hall were, were enormous. Um, and they were <clears throat> for five to 8,000 people. Um, uh, so that was, I don't need to begin to tell you how complicated and, and busy that was. But they became even bigger when we took them abroad. So mm -hmm. we did it in Australia. Um, and I think there had been, well, I know there had been a plan to bring it to the States, but that never was fulfilled. Yeah. But suddenly doing a show, um, which feels enormous to do in London, when you're suddenly doing it in Melbourne and then Sydney at the Opera House, it's considerably harder because where do I begin? You've got to ship over your props. You can't fly Daleks out because they're too expensive. They have to go on a boat. And that means it has to depart six weeks before. Um, 
you, you know the actors you can't why would you spend money flying british actors out to the state to the US, australia it makes more sense to recruit new actors uh, in australia to play the silence the dialects the sidemen but then you've got to teach them how to move and so i was there involved uh, along with a movement coordinator teaching people what cybermen were and how they moved and all that kind of stuff. Wow. Um, it's a lot more complicated dealing with um, a venue like the Sydney Opera House than it is the Royal Albert House because it's so much bigger. Um, uh, um, so there's huge considerations. Um, it's a different market as well, um, different expectations, uh, different history. It was a fantastic time and um, Twice I went out to do different concerts out there. I managed to peg on a holiday at the end of it because if you're going to travel to the other side of the world, you may as well uh, take a vacation while you're there as well. But by the time we'd done two weeks' work, I was so exhausted. <laughs> I didn't really get to, to enjoy it as much as I would have liked. But fantastic experiences to have, to have that knowledge, definitely. Um, I've got a question about coordinating the different product lines. When you're talking about the comics, novels, the audios, they, I'm sure, sometimes pitch an idea that too closely coincides with what the TV show is about to do. So how early do you get um, scripts or pitches from these different licensees, and how do you coordinate it with the television production? Yeah, I mean, it's a tough one. Um, so we will know what the, I'm talking in present tense now, uh, but let's just imagine we're going back a few years. It's easier to do it in present sense. We all know <laughs> what the upcoming storylines are um, before they're written, hopefully. Um, as this, each series developed, the ones at the end might be a bit more woolly and we might know less about it, the stories that were going to be the finale. But generally, um, let's go to, I don't know, series Series three, the one that first features Martha, we know there's going to be a story about um, Shakespeare. We know there's going to be a story um, about Daleks in, in New York. And there's going to be a story where the doctor is sent to 1914's England and works as a teacher. So we would um, let the book companies know about that. Let Big Fi Finish know about that. Big Finish, of course, are the licensee that do the audio adventures. Um, and so they would, in theory, know what the rough outline is. But that doesn't mean that those storylines might not change or we might not give enough detail. So we would have to see scripts in, in advance. We'd see storylines first, because that's how stories are created. The storyline is drafted and then a script is written from that. Um, and hopefully root out any conflicts there. I do remember, I think it was a book idea from BBC Books around um, the making of series nine, which was the second Peter Capaldi um, adventure, a uh, series rather. And well, there was a story idea that came through about sentient spacesuits. Um, and of course, that conflicted with the story or oh, the oxygen. Oxygen. Uh, yeah. oxygen. Um, <laughs> it was too similar to that. Um, so we were able to nix that before it um, was turned into a full script. Um, so, yeah. I had to do that. Somebody had to do it. People mm -hmm. did it before me. I only did that in the last 18 months before I left. Um, there were great people like Scott Hancock and Gary Russell um, mm -hmm. and Derek Ritchie that did it before me. Um, and uh, yeah, so every single, for that 18 month period, I read every single big Finnish script and every Doctor Who book and every magazine comic strip idea, um, uh, which, you know, I was paid for that. There are, what, a, what a brilliant opportunity to do that. Yeah. Now, I know that you are working on a book about yeah. your time on the show. So yeah. I hope, hope that we haven't asked any questions that led you to give away too much information and, you know, that we would eventually read in the book. Um, what inspired you to to start this project and uh, how was the research process? Well, uh, I hope my publisher isn't uh, listening to this because I'm sure I was supposed to deliver the, the manuscript a, a month ago. Uh, I'm blaming, corona, I'm blaming coronavirus for delaying me. Uh, um, it was Russell that came up with the idea, actually, originally. He uh, emailed me when I left and said, now write that book. I don't know if he was being serious. Oh, wow. But he said, you've been across so many eras of the show. You've got so many stories. Write that book. And, of course, when Russell says something, you don't ignore it. But I wasn't quite sure what the book was. I thought, 
for a long time I thought, oh, I will write the making of modern Doctor Who. Um, and I'll use my insight and my contacts. I'll be able to get interviews with everybody. Um, and I kind of let it percolate in the back of my mind and sort of came up with ideas. And I wasn't really inspired. And I guess I realized that those stories were already out there. Um, they've been documented on Doctor Who Confidential in various right. magazines, including, of course, Doctor Who magazine. And yeah, people might talk about them a bit differently 10, 15 years later. Yes, I might be able to get new interviews, but I didn't really think there was much of an appetite. But I spoke to a few publishers and they kept saying, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. But what about your stories? And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and they kept pushing me and it became clear that the stories that I had, I don't mean about me, I'm, you know, I don't mean about who I was dating or, or where I went on holiday, um, but the, the my involvement in Doctor Who were interesting. Now, as you can hear me talking nonstop, I love talking about myself, but I, I was a bit embarrassed about doing that. I didn't want wanted to write a memoir. That seemed a bit pretentious, really. Who, who's going to read that? Um, but as I sort of did some examples and worked with um, an editor and other people, other friends, uh, including yourself, Alan, I realized that um, actually those stories are interesting. Um, and so I've just started to write them. Um, the book is planned out. Um, every paragraph is is planned and I'm just fleshing it out. But what's really interesting in terms of research, I have spoken to colleagues. I've gone to people I work with to get their stories. Um, but a lot of it is in there and it's just tucked away. So I'm remembering incidents and starting to write about it. And literally as I'm typing the sentences, I think, oh yeah, and then that happened. And then this happened. And oh, nobody knows about that. Um, mm -hmm. And it's tiny things. Um, I don't want to give anything away, but it's it's seemingly trivial things actually ended up um, as really great stories and, and, and fun things, especially anything around the cast. Um, when we came to the States in at the end of 2010 to shoot stuff for series six for the opener. Yeah. It was very hard work. Um, as you can imagine, we only had a short time to shoot in. We were with a different crew. I came over because there was a huge expectation of photography and somebody needed um, somebody to manage the, the, the photography that was happening. So I was uh, lucky enough to come out for those um, shoots. Um, but we did down tours at the end of it. Um, we had to fly out the following morning, but everyone wanted to go out for a drink. And we ended up in a spit and sawdust place in... I think it was in Utah. I can't remember. Uh, and um, Karen Gillan, Arthur Dovell and Matt Smith and me and a few other people, we had quite a few drinks and uh, there was a bit of a drama happened there uh, <laughs> that I remembered. And I spoke about this when I met Arthur Darvel in Chicago last year and we were reminiscing and we were going, and I was like, I'm going to put that book, bit in the book. And he's like, no, you can't put that bit in the book. I'm like, mm, you're right, you're right. What about this bit? And he's like, well, maybe if you change the names and stuff like that. So, yeah, there's going to be some, so, nothing, there's nothing bad in there. You're not going to hear some terrible fallings out or anything like that because I, I don't want to tell those stories. Well, I'm not even saying those stories exist, but I don't think those stories, you know, uh, are of interest, um, believe it or not. I genuinely think there are some people that think they want all the gossip, but the, the gossip is boring. It's much more interesting to, to find out, uh, um someone else's perspective and hear about hear about people that you wouldn't normally have heard about so for example um i think you'll be familiar with the fact that we had kylie minogue on, on the series now kylie minogue at the time was a huge um huge huge pop star in the us and i know she's in the uk and i know that she's less well known in the states but uh, at the time she was as big as britney spears or madonna was and um <clears throat> so that was a huge thing and her costume designer um assistant rather who would dress her every day they got on so well that kylie ended up taking lou on tour with her so there's little stories like that that it's nice to be able to tell and hopefully they'll be interesting if they're not well i've got my advance <laughs> so, uh, I, I think it, i think it's going to be a good book um i hope so anyway definitely well you gave me the privilege of reading a chapter of it and it was the kylie chapter and it was fascinating i absolutely loved it and i learned a couple of really interesting behind the scenes things that I would never have thought of. Good. So I'm excited to read the whole thing. Yeah. It's kind of going to be telling stories that people didn't even know existed. I think yeah. that's what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, now, once you left Doctor Who, which I'm sure had to be a tough choice to make, um, because how can you give up the job that every Doctor Who fan would kill to have? 
Um, you went on to a couple of other projects uh, professionally, and one of them involves Wallace and Gromit. Yeah, that's right. Um, it was a really tough um, choice. It wasn't necessarily a choice because my job came to an end. Um, and without boring people, um, the various rings of uh, the BBC joined together, which meant my job was no longer needed. Um, so the tough thing was to leave the BBC. I could have stayed at the BBC and, and done another job. But I think I would have found that weird um, to still be at the BBC but not working on Doctor Who. It's a bit like um, getting divorced and staying living in the same house while your 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 ex moves in their new partner. So so that that was um that was a quite tough choice to make. Um, and yeah, it was weird not being on Doctor Who again. It's a bit like the whole ex thing, and you you you're happy. You know, it was a mutual separation, but there there was somebody new. It's a it's a bit weird. Um, and I, I had to take stock, really. I didn't go straight to another job. I sort of did a bit of consultancy work, including lecturing, uh, and took it took it slowly, um, really, which was probably the best way to do it. But yeah, I am I'm working on a fascinating project for Wallace and Gromit, which is coming to fruition, actually. So I think at the time when I came out to Hulanta last year, I was not far into it, and now it's almost ready. So it's a new Wallace and Gromit story, a brand new adventure along the lines of The Wrong Trousers and The Close Shave and all those other big films, but it's not a film. It's going to be experienced in a different way. It's a deliberate attempt by Ardman Animation and the company that I'm working for to find new ways of telling stories. Um, and uh, it's going to be experienced via an app. Um, the whole concept is that Wallace and Gromit have set up a a new company called Spick and Spanners, which is an odd jobs company to do jobs around their local town. Um, but they get a contract um, from somebody to to expand it and they need help. And so you become an employer, an employee rather of Wallace and Gromit. If you download <laughs> the app, you get to do jobs. And um, this is all a mechanic for feeding you stories. So you'll get stories in different ways. You'll get comic strips through to the app. You'll get phone calls um, from Wallace and Gromit. You'll get AR. Um, augmented reality things that happen so you can actually be in the world you have wallace and gromit come into your to your room and but the story will come to you that way and it plays out over a period so it's really different it's technology technologically very advanced um and um it, it might not work and it's great to be working on something which is allowed to fail um i don't think it will i think it's gonna do really well um but it's very freeing to be that so I've, I've i'm really lucky to have worked on some huge brands top, top of the pops doctor who and now wallace and gromit um and and to be at dragon con as well you know i'm the luckiest person alive definitely <laughs> <laughs> okay well let's talk about i mean you are constantly busy with so many different projects you are also a songwriter musician singer <laughs> yeah. So uh, tell us a little bit about your music and where people can find your music. I don't know if I'm a singer, um, but uh, but I certainly sing the songs that I wrote. I mean, it's just a hobby. It's just a hobby. I, I enjoy pop music and I've got an OK talent for writing pop songs, um, slightly less talent for singing them. But that doesn't stop me because I love <laughs> doing it. And it, it's although it's a hobby, it's something that um, when I'm in the zone, it really um, takes over. So. Um, I've done lots of stuff over the years, but I did a whole album um, last year, which I'm really proud of, called Binary, and you can get that on streaming platforms. So Apple Music and Spotify, check it out. Um, uh, I think it's, they're, they're good pop songs, and they're kind of they're kind of in the vein of kind of '80s pop songs. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you know they've got guitars in them as well, and and some sort of modern sounds. But you know, I think people that like things like Depeche Mode and stuff like that would would find it quite similar sounding. Um, I'm working on stuff now. I have been for ages and it's just, I, like you said, I'm so busy. And along with lockdown, that's kind of thrown a spanner in the works, but I'm, I'm working on new stuff. Uh, so if anybody listens to it and enjoys it, they can rest assured there'll be more stuff along soonish. Excellent. So there, yeah, yeah. And you are currently <clears throat> producing a podcast. Yeah, this happened yeah. by accident. It's, it's a fantastic podcast, I will say. Thank you very much. Um, it's it's somehow become a really popular podcast as well. Um, 
So this was at the beginning of lockdown, and I think there was a bit of a joke that everyone was starting podcasts, and there were too many podcasts going in the world. I never listen to podcasts. Uh, yeah. My partner does all the time, um, but I don't. Um, but I thought about doing one just because I thought we had a lot of time on our hands at the beginning of lockdown, certainly. Uh, I'm a big fan of pop music, I said, in particular Madonna. Um, and um, being a songwriter and producer myself, I've got a particular interest in how the songs are put together. Um, and I think the song Vogue had just turned 30, the anniversary for it had just happened. Um, and I've got some demos of it and some um, the multi-track recordings, the little bits of it that go together. And I thought, OK, I'm going to do a podcast talking about the story, looking at various interviews, how it was put together, what samples are in it, what inspired it, um, and just put it, you know, nice little package, which I did. Um, and it got 100 listens, and I was like, oh, this is okay, I'll do another one. Before <laughs> I'd even done the next one, it had 200 listens and then 500 listens, and I thought, this is going somewhere. <clears throat> and I did a few more episodes covering other songs like Open Your Heart and Ray of Light, and suddenly got interest from people who wanted to be interviewed, people that had been involved with Madonna. And um, well, here we are now five months later and uh, 25 episodes later. The podcast is getting 8,000 listens a week. Um, I think it's had something like 65,000 downloads since I started. Um, I've just monetized it as well. Um, so that, and this is voluntary, if people want to become a patron and, and put money towards it then then they can do but they, they don't have to but you know so it's now only money for me as well um and and i still i'm taken by surprise but it's been really popular i i, I think it's mainly because um during lockdown and these difficult times people are thinking back to their past and the songs that got them on the dance floor and they make them feel happy and madonna has covered nearly 40 years of of happiness that we want to revisit but um you know i People say it's it's professional sounding and well put together. It is. Um, thank you. Um, so uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I should take some credit for it as well. <laughs> and apparently, I've got a really sexy voice. I keep getting messages <laughs> saying this, um, uh, which I, is is weird. I have no idea uh, of concept of this, um, but I'll get um, a, a DM on on Twitter from people saying I always listen to it as I go to bed because you've got a really sexy voice, which is great. No. If they want to pay for it, that's fine. <laughs> so, yeah, I guess what you're alluding to is I like to keep busy. I'm yeah. actually quite a lazy person, but um, I find if I sit still for too long, I get to fidget. So this is a way to address that. Exactly. I'm the same way. I am just lazy by nature, but I also have this ridiculous drive to just be involved in things and to create things. And it's ridiculous. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think if I had this motivation and wasn't lazy, I'd probably be running the world by now, but yeah. it's probably, probably exactly. just as well that I am. But uh, yeah, it's called Inside the Groove. Um, so if people want to check that out, um, uh, yeah, it's, if you like pop music, I don't think you have to even be t particularly a fan of Madonna. It's it's like it examines production techniques. Yeah. So um, things like the drum machines that are used on those early 80s tracks. Mm -hmm. And talking about them and how they were created and all that kind of stuff. So it's it's wider reaching than just Madonna herself. So yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I'm not much of a podcast listener either, but I I have really enjoyed it. It's really well written, well produced, well presented, yeah. and you just do a fantastic job with it. So I hope people you listen, you listen to it before you go to sleep, Alan. <laughs> oh, oh, I do. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so. Uh, thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to speak with us and the Dragon Con audience. Thank you for having me, and and I really hope that I can get to be there in person. If this was an audition, I hope I've I've got the job because I would. <laughs> oh, well. I'd love to come to Dragon Con because I've heard how huge it is, how it spans four venues or, or what have you. Um, but also because my trip to Atlanta was brief and it's not over yet. I need to come back out. You absolutely do. We have a lot more stuff that we need to do when next time you're here. And so many of your friends have been to Dragon Con. Peter Capaldi and Karen Gillan and, you know, all these folks have been there. And so it's just a natural that you need to be here, too. Yeah, definitely. Well, hopefully next time I see you will be in person. Excellent. Well, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everyone who is watching. Um, look for other content that the Brit Track has got coming out this weekend. 
Um, you can find Brent Track on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. So check out all of our channels to find all of our great content. Thanks so much, Edward. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much. And thanks everyone for watching. Enjoy the rest of your Dragon Con.